Good afternoon, and welcome to the Armenian Studies Program Lecture Series. It is um, an honor and a pleasure to be introducing to you today Tolga Jora, uh, a Manugian fellow, uh, postdoctoral fellow at the Armenian Studies Program. Um, and I would also like to thank the History Department, uh, who are absent today because there is a retreat up to five, unfortunately, with a last minute rescheduling for housing uh, Tolga Jora and for actually welcoming him um, into their community. Joro is an Ottoman social and economic historian who received his PhD in June of 2016 from the University of Chicago. His dissertation, Transforming Erzurum or Karin, the social and economic history of a multi-ethnic Ottoman city in the 19th century, is a study of the notables of Erzurum from around 1816 until the outbreak of uh, the First World War. His study of local notables spans a period of reform that transformed the structures of governance both in Istanbul and in Erzurum, a city at the crossroads of domestic and international trade with an ethnically and religiously mixed population. Using a multifaceted corpus of sources from Ottoman state documents to counselor reports and memoirs of Armenian notables, Jora traces shifts in a complex web of relations that involved Ottoman officials, members of the Armenian church hierarchy, foreign merchants and diplomats, and local Muslim notables to write a microhistory of how communal policy, politics reconfigured the local economy as it altered Muslim-Armenian relations, as well as the power dynamics amongst um, the Armenian community at large. Deploying networks as an analytic, Jorov fills an important lacune, a black hole, as he calls it, in Ottoman social and economic history. Jura already has a prolific publication record, a book of translation from Ar Armenian into Turkish um, entitled, and I'm translating in, in English, Memoirs of Lieutenant Galust Surmenyan during the First World War and the Armenian deportations. He has co-edited a volume on the Ottoman East in the 19th century together with our very own Zovinar Derderian and Ali Sepohi, for which he has written an article or a chapter on Ottoman historiography's black hole. Seven more articles on a variety of subjects from the absence of class analysis in the historiography uh, on Armenians in the Ottoman East to Kurdish-Armenian conflicts in the East, the life of Pastor Maji Khachatur Efendi, an Ottoman Ar Armenian elite in mid-19th century Erzurum. Today, he will be talking to us about the likes of Pastor Maci Khachatur Efendi, Armenian men of a new order. Please join me in welcoming Tolga Jora. Thank you very much for giving me such a great introduction. And I hope I can fulfill your expectations, if you have any. OK. Uh, hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. This is the part that I have to go through. Sorry. That's uh, for this beautiful winter day. I was telling that it's the Fahrenheit, so it's very difficult for me to convert this bad weather from Fahrenheit to Celsius when it goes below 20. Before I start my talk today, I would like to thank to the people of Armenian Studies Program, its faculty and administration, and also history department, who unfortunately cannot be here today, for hosting me at the U Michigan and looking after me very well. And I'm serious with that. Without hesitation, I can say this has been a very productive period for me, and I'm looking forward to the coming months with better weather. I also would like to thank my wife, who has been giving me an enormous support and understanding. In the next 50 minutes or so, I tried to shorten my talk, really, but I couldn't. I'm sorry. But I will talk about Ottoman Armenian communities, and particularly their leaders in the eastern provinces of the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century. My talk is based on some of the findings from my dissertation and the research that I made in the last few months as a fellow here. Also during my stay here, here as a fellow, I have been thinking about ways to reinterpret some of my earlier findings and develop my work in new dimensions for my book manuscript. Hopefully it's coming. I will share them with you in my conclusion. No need to say I appreciate your comments, criticisms, and suggestions. 
inshallah, from now on, the defeat of the infidels, the kuffar, will become apparent, wrote Kukçubaşı Agop Efendi, an Armenian notable from Erzurum. In a letter to a the, it was in a letter to a local Ottoman bureaucrat. The letter, now in the Ottoman archives in Istanbul, was written in the midst of the Crimean War. It celebrated the news about the advancement of the Allied troops in Sevastopol against the Russian forces, whom the Armenian notable labeled as infidels. And it included some information about a business transaction of the notable. This private letter is an intriguing document to a modern day audience especially from the perspective of conventional approaches to provincial Armenians' imperial past, which tend to see a multi-layered and multi-dimensional history only through oppression, violence, the genocide, and the resurrection of Armenian communities. Yet, Agop's letter was by no means strange in the context of the mid-19th century, nor can it be isolated from who the notable was. Kukçubaşı Agop was one of the two army contractors on the Ottoman Eastern Front during the Crimean War the richest and one of the most powerful and well-connected men in the northeastern corner of the Ottoman Empire. As I will discuss today, Agops and other Armenian notables' histories cannot be reduced to a national or ethnic history, or even the imperial history. They were conscious actors and should have their own histories, seen and written in an interaction with other histories. For sympathetic listeners, Agops' biography, which I will de the detail in the first half of the talk, can easily be seen as a success story. It shows the opportunities open to a provincial Armenian power holder in the era of the Ottoman Age of Reform and the extent of his social networks. For instance, when two top-ranking military commanders visited the Armenian community school built by Agop in Arzurum in 16, uh, 1864, they were mesmerized by the notable services to the Armenian community and their work to the empire. According to the Armenian daily newspaper, Jamanak, Istanbul, the Pashas exclaim, such men, implying Agop Efendi, are worthy of immortality with the indelible memories they leave for the ages. Agop's immortality was a reference to the economic, social, and symbolic capital which he accumulated during the age of reforms. He was a man of the new order. Agop's story, however, is not the only chapter of this untold story. There were other notables, such as Sachatur Efendi, Pastor Maji, the pasturma or dried meat maker in Arzurum, whose life I will examine in the second part of my talk. Like Agop, Hachatur Efendi crossed ethno-confessional boundaries in various ways. He was simultaneously stepping into a symbolic territory where not many non-Muslims had tread before, and moving onto a ground shared by people of high standing, a club of elites made up of notables of di different ethnic and religious groups. This was a moment in Ottomanism, or the creation of new imperial ethnicity, which denoted equality of Ottoman subjects regardless of ethno-religious background. Yet, it had its limits. Hachatur Efendi was shot dead while he was chatting in front of his shop, along with his brother, who was an imperial office holder, and the director of the telegraph office, a Muslim Turk. The Armenian provincial notables were men of power. And in this talk, when I say notables, I use it to refer to a group of men, and exclusively men, who were power brokers between their communities and the outside. And when I say provincial, I mean not that they were backward, but they had their power base within a certain locality and group an extensive network with the wider world. The notables possessed economic, social, and symbolic power and controlled their communities financially and socially. Their position in their own communities provided them a chance for social mobility in the imperial system, which was under transformation in the 19th century and their relations with the imperial authorities were used to exert more control within their communities and suppress the dissent against them. However, in this talk, I will not approach them as intermediaries who connected the state to the communities. Such approach is a legacy of the functionalist school of social anthropology. Informed by the mid-20th century theories, historians of Middle, East studies, uh, Middle Eastern studies saw the notables as intermediaries who disseminated uh, values from the center to the periphery, providing for a cohesive, cohesive functioning of the society. This approach not only reproduces now questioned dichotomies of center and periphery, but also necessitates that we approach state and community as static and unchanging entities. Instead, by following ethnographers' views of the modern state, such as, such as those of Akhil Gupta of modern India, 
I will approach the Ottoman state as an amalgamation of various institutions whose construction was based on cooperation and sometimes struggle between the various parties involved. These actors, including the notables, changed and were simultaneously changed by personal relations based on their own interests and on everyday practices. By focusing on everyday practices, this interactive approach to the state on personal, local, and imperial scales challenges the state's image as an autonomous entity standing outside society. I argue that the reforming Ottoman state was constructed simultaneously with its constituents, among them as ethnic religious communities and their leaders. I call this process the new imperial order. The mainstream works on Ottoman history, especially those on the reforms, focus on the Ottoman state and people closely associated with the state, primarily Muslims, whereas Armenian historiography attributes agency only to what it deems valuable to its national and nationalist history, namely the Armenian elite of Istanbul, reformist and patriotic clergy, and in later periods, the revolutionaries. Thus, my talk today, in addition to recovering the histories of these Armenian provincial notables, aims to contribute to the already developing dialogue between the two histories and <coughs> historiographic traditions. To put it in other words, as the notables were usually considered as bridges between their communities and the state, I see their biographies as venues to bridge the gaps between Ottoman Turkish and Armenian histories and mutually change them. Keeping these historiographical goals and therefore the uh, theoretical framework, I will now present you two short biographies of Erzurum, uh, notables, both of them from the province of Erzurum. Erzurum, the capital and the most important town of this last province on the northeastern corner of the empire, was always of great importance. Ottoman Erzurum, or Garin, or Karin in Armenian, was a first-class city of Ottoman Anatolia, according to a 19th century Ottoman historical geographer. And almost all foreign visitors to the region referred to it as the capital of the Upper Armenian Plateau, Batsrahai. The city of Erzurum was a city of 60,000 people in the late 19th century, about a quarter of whom were Armenian. In addition to the Muslim majority and the Armenians of all den denominations, there were other smaller communities of Greeks and Persians in the city. Its economic role as a major production and redistribution center, a trade hub in the middle of the Persian European trade through the Black Sea, a military headquarters as a center of the Fourth Imperial Army and the defenses against the Russians, and its political administrative importance as the provincial capital rendered the city an ideal place to examine the interaction between the Ottoman state and the Armenian notables and their mutual construction during the age of reforms. Kürtçübaşı Makarya Nagop's origins are not well known. All we know is he migrated to Erzurum from the town of Arapkir in the south and established himself as an important merchant in the 1840s in Erzurum. Yet he was still a protégé of stronger power holders who belonged to the older generation and former imperial order. Among them, the most important one was Karabet, son of Murat, with whom Agop established an unequal but profitable partnership. For instance, in the mid-1840s, the two moneylenders, uh, right after the proclamation of reforms in Erzurum, collaborated to collect the communal taxes from the Armenian community. Yet the bigger partner, Karabet, was soon expelled to Istanbul as a result of a conflict he had with the bishop and established himself as a moneylender in the Ottoman capital. He continued to carry out his business in Erzurum through Agop. In 1850, they joined forces with two Muslim notables to obtain the right to collect custom duties at Erzurum. The customs of Erzurum was one of the most lucrative customs in the Ottoman Empire, as it was on the Iranian-European trade routes. These partnerships were important for different respects. I will only mention a few of them. First, in the age of reforms, Armenian notables were instrumental in connecting the imperial center to the provinces through their personal networks. Tax farming contracts continued, as had been the case in the 18th century, to connect provincial elites and Istanbul. Yet there were differences. The reconfiguration of political and economic power in the 19th century had affected the spatial mobility of the Notables. The rise of Agop in Erzurum, without moving to Istanbul, was, an, uh, was able to accumulate capital. He was the first Armenian notable to not to move to Istanbul from Erzurum, despite the immense economic and social capital he accumulated, or precisely because of it. In the age of reforms, 
Agop was able to attain power by staying in Arzu. In the age of centralization, or what we think as centralization of power in Istanbul, the provinces themselves turned into nodes of different economic and social networks. Bishop Devkan, an important 19th century ecclesiastical figure who visited Erzurum in the early 1870s, noted this change in the spatial dimension of power relations in the following terms. The Makaryan notable family, Gerdasan, over which Makaryan Kürkçüba Şagop Efendi presides, who hasn't moved to yet to police has fame and influence in the government of the province of Karin because he engaged in contracting, he obtained great wealth. However, he never had mercy and care for the poor and the villages, but mercilessly oppressed them, and especially those in the villages of Taron region, Tiflis and Mush. I can go back to this, uh, the oppression part in the Q&A. The reason for his stay in Erzurum was the opportunities presented by the age of reforms. Farming of taxes by local men of power, rather than collection by agents of the central government, as I already said, was a continuation of the former order. Yet, in the 19th century, the rights to collect taxes uh, were granted by local auctions to the highest bidders. Therefore, obtaining them required not only economic capital to pay a lump sum payment to the government treasury as a guarantee for future payment, but also immense and multidimensional social capital at the local level. On the one hand, the tax farmer had to have good relations with the bureaucratic elite of the region to obtain tax farms and acquire their help when needed. And on the other, he should be able to exert influence and control over the lesser notables and bureaucrats to whom he delegated his rights to collect taxes at town and village levels. The Ottoman archives are full of such cases in which Agop interacts with the governors as well as lesser notables in the region, sometimes for business and other times to solve problems between them. These interactions at personal and local levels, not examined in the scholarship, can give us clues about the inter-ethnic power relations at this early period of reform. The vertical and horizontal power relations created by these tax farming agreements were essential to the construction and functioning of the state and accumulation of a notable economic capital. I will examine these relations in more detail in the case of Kukchubash's provisioning of the Ottoman army during the Crimean War. The building of a modern army uh, one of the goals of the reforming Ottoman state since the late 18th century, culminated in the 19th century. It was a multi-layered enterprise, requiring the introduction of mandatory conscription, reorgani reorganizing of the army, opening up of schools for the army officers, all of which aimed to modernize and strengthen the Ottoman war machine. These are well examined in the scholarship. Yet the logistics of the army, both during the war and at peace, is closely related to the growth of the modern military structure and this hasn't attracted much interest from scholars. It's a site in which we can examine the agency of Armenian notables and their role in the new imperial order. Kürkçubaşı Agop's relations with the army with which I opened this talk are well documented. The reason for documentation is that they were the subject of the great embezzlement scandal in the mid-19th century, which encompassed a wide range of bureaucrats and army commanders, ranging from a field marshal to a village grenier director. Kürkçüba Şagop was right in the middle of the relations connecting these dispersed people. Kürkçüba Şagop's first service to the army, I mean contract, that we know of was during the preparations for the war, the Crimean War. The commander was Mustafa Zarif Pasha, and he had asked the notable to supply the army with 250 tons of grain, and I'm giving the numbers for a reason. This was followed by Agop's second business deal, which was to supply the fortress of Kars, the last Ottoman resort against the Russian advances, with 1,500 tons of grain. Still, these contracts were small compared to the notable's final contract, a massive one for 27,500 tons of grain, a, and a huge amount of other provisions, including a monopoly over the means of transport to carry them from the granaries to the field. According to the notable's testimony, the field commander, Zarif Pasha, had stated that if the notable fulfilled these co contracts, quote, this will be very, something very good for you in the eyes of the state, and a new concession to you will be necessary, end of quote. There are no details about what was meant by a new concession, whether it was a right of monopoly over a commodity or a set of privileges, but as I will discuss shortly, the promise of concessions and their non-fulfillment was brought up by the notable when dealing with the state authorities. The army contracting business worked through Agop's 
social and economic capital at various levels. For instance, he collaborated with the chief scribe of province of uh, Sivas, who had used his official position to hoard grain and sell it to the army through Armenian notable. Agop also collaborated with another army contractor, Kozma, an Anatolian Greek, to exchange uh, grain when needed. In addition to these horizontal networks, Agop had established vertical relations with village leaders, both Muslims and non-Muslims. For instance, a letter written to the notable by one of their agents in the countryside gives details of such networks. The letter was written by a certain Kaspar, who was responsible for maintaining the business of Agop's private granary in the village. He reported how the local Muslim landowner and the scribe of the district, another Muslim, took very good care of Agop's business in those regions. The mentioned scribe himself also wrote a letter to the Armenian notable and complained about laziness of two Armenian agents of the notable as well. Thus, besides enjoying close relations and forming illegal partnerships with government officials, Kukchubashi controlled other social networks composed of lesser bureaucrats, village elders, and all of which were necessary to carry out the army contracting business. What did these and tens of other instances of close relations with the state officials and extensive social networks mean for the notable in terms of his sense of belonging to the Ottoman Empire? It is difficult to answer this question, though the vocabulary he used in the interrogation report gives us some ideas about it. Potential problems in writing, recording, translation notwithstanding, his testimony is a rare one. In the interrogation room in Istanbul in 1856, Kukçubaşı Agop, as expected, presented himself as an Armenian notable who was a loyal subject to the Sultan and the Empire. He penned a memorandum as a part of the interrogation process. Quote, what follows from here is a presentation of a summary of my various humble services, which I showed as a community. That's Armenian. The strange wording used in the text, I showed as a community, milletçe ibraz eyledi, might be a scribal mistake. However, given that Agop promoted himself as the leader of the Armenian community in Erzurum, the ambiguous language might have been a conscious choice. As I hold a high status in my community, Kukçubaşı Agop continued, and listed his services. The notable and the bishop had preached in the churches and they helped the Ottoman army by various means. Among the material support they had given, they provided provisions sought by the army and arranged for the payment of war assistance, donation, basically a tax. The, then the notable lists the services of Armenians of Erzurum to the army. According to him, each day for nine months, 400 or 50, 500 Armenians work in the fortifications for free, carrying away the soil and stones of the field. 380 houses around the fortifications were emptied and their people moved to other houses and so on. And this is for the accommodation of the soldiers. In all these sentences, the notable equated himself with his community, the Armenians of Erzurum, and constructed the sentences as questions, asking the first person plural, we. They were either in negative forms, such as, did we not give, did we not donate, did we not do, or in the form of, what deficiency did we have in doing such and such. And finally, the most important promises of the reform era, the protection of life, honor, and property of all subjects by the Sultan are turned upside down. They, the notables, fulfill their debt of loyalty and servitude to the Sultan and the state. I quote, as the honor and property of our community belongs to our Sultan, end of quote. There are a few issues here that require attention. This rhetoric of servitude is to be expected of a non-Muslim subject under interrogation. But it is important to note that he emphasized the negotiable character of that loyalty. And more importantly, he underlined his role as a notable who ensured the loyalty of his local community. He positioned himself as the main actor in organizing the Armenians' participation in the war effort in Erzurum. With the bishop, he was the one who mobilized, we, the Armenians in Erzurum. It is also noteworthy that Kukçubaşı did not refer to Armenians in other regions of the empire, not even in the neighboring regions but mentioned only the services of Armenians in Erzurum during the war. Last but not least, the notable expected that there would be a mutual understanding between him and the addressee of the memorandum on the definition of loyalty as something that is open to bargaining. The more loyal you are, the more privileges you should get, or in this case, better treatment. In the middle of these, Kukçubaşı's main complaint was that he did not get 
those privileges or concessions which the army commander had promised him in return for his services. Most of all, as a loyal subject and the leader of a loyal community, the notable did not deserve the treatment he received, i.e. the accusations and arrests. He should be treated as a part of the establishment. In this new imperial order, in which Armenian notables had turned into partners of the empire in the provinces, loyalty and patriotism were still being defined. And they were not merely feelings or emotions, they were quantifiable objects measured by the services of a notable's community. The, this patriotism was neither related to the top-down state policy that aimed to mobilize its Muslim population through mainly religious enthusiasm during the Crimean War, which has been examined in the scholarship, nor does it suit to our dominant understanding of official patriotism of the state, the Ottomanism, that wanted to gather its subject peoples under the banner of imperial ethnicity. Instead, the patriotism and loyalty of Agop Efendi were in the process of being defined. They were political, economic, and emotional efforts used primarily as venues for negotiation of rights and obligations of both the privileged subjects and the state in the new imperial order. Notables like Fırçıba Şagop, who, thanks to their social and economic capital, were capable of speaking that language, turned it into an opportunity to negotiate their positions within the society, particularly their control over the local Armenian community. The rest of Agop's life is even more eventful, yet it is impossible to cover here. To give a synopsis, uh, I will say that he was soon freed, thanks to his, the intervention of his friends in high places, and went back to Erzurum. His business thrived. For instance, during the famine year of 1863, he obtained a monopoly over the wheat market of Erzurum for a year and was given the permission to set the price and sell his own grain, showing that his wartime connections were largely intact. This was a year before Agop built the school for the Armenian community and was praised by the Pashas as a man that history should not forget, which I mentioned at the introduction of my talk. During the 1860s, half of the Armenian community, particularly the artisans, who lost their power against the notable, uh, tried to remove Agop and his closest ally, the bishop, from the city. For the details and importance of such intercommunal conflicts, in the period caused by the transformation in the age of reforms and emergence like notables, uh, emergence of notables like Kirchubashi, you have to wait for my monograph or the Q and A. What I will do in the second half of my talk is to reconstruct the life of another Armenian notable, Hachot Refendi, <clears throat> the pastor maker. The, to show the other possibilities and limits in the life stories of Armenian notables in the same period. There were other ways, or ways other than tax farming, to make money in the Ottomans, such as trade and manufacturing and real estate development. There were also different ways to express the cordial relations between the state and the leaders of the Armenian community, and between those leaders and other confessional groups. In short, there were different possibilities in the new imperial order. Hachatur Efendi was born into a relatively humble family of butchers in Erzurum. His father was among the very few families that did not migrate from Erzurum to Russia following the mass migration of the Ottoman-Russia War of 1828-29. Being a native partially explains Hachatur Efendi's relatively quick success in his trade. Hachatur Efendi must have inherited, inherited social capital from his father, especially in terms of his networks with the livestock merchants who bought animals from the surrounding villages and the nomadic tribes. Livestock was the most important trade item of the region of Erzurum. Its trade between the region and other regions of the empire involved many actors. Kurdish nomads who owned sheep, peasants who raised sheep either on their own or for local entrepreneurs, uh, merchants who came from outside Erzurum to purchase sheep, local merchants who served as intermediaries and financed the affairs and local Muslim and Armenian elites who invested in tax farming the levies on sheep. Hachatur Efendi was one of the merchants at the top of these networks. He financed merchants from northern Syria, where meat from Anatolian plateau, and especially from Erzurum, was in high demand. Changes in the agricultural production in Syria arise in the cultivation of export-oriented grain and cash crops in the 19th century, resulted in an increasing demand for livestock in that period. Thus. While the Syrian economy was incorporated into Europe, 
as many historians have made a point of showing, it was simultaneously also incorporated into Anatolia and Empire. Merchants like Hachatur Efendi played a major role in, in this intensification of trade and credit networks within the empire. Hachatur Efendi was also involved in pastrama production. Pastrama, an Anatolian delicacy of Central Asian origin, is a slice of beet, ideally from the choice of sections of a cow, uh, seasoned with garlic and local herb, and dried in the sun. Before it attained the status of an expensive delicacy in Turkey, Armenia, and Lebanon, however, pastrama had been a food mainly for the lower classes in the countryside who did not have access to fresh mutton and of the expanding army. The transformation of dried meat from part of a daily diet in winter to an almost ritualistic product of great value, that one that might be at the top item on the Muslims' uh, tables during Ramadan, is an interesting topic. It can be explained by the concepts of intensification and extensification used by Sidney Mintz to describe uses of sugar in British society, the British colonial society. Yet instead of pursuing the social history of this commodity, uh, I have done it elsewhere, here I will focus on its production and trade in Erzurum and Hachatur Efendi as its producer. Erzurum was one of the major dried meat production, pastrama production locations in the empire. Both the French and the British consuls in Erzurum put at around 4,000 the number of cattle that were slaughtered for dried meat production in the city. The bulk of this product was sold in the market in Istanbul. The population of imperial capital, which tripled in the second half of the 19th century from 300,000 to 900,000 people, and had lost most of its access to fresh mutton due to the separation of the Balkan provinces, the primary suppliers of meat. The right meat was one of the solutions to this problem. And Hachatur Efendi was at the heart of this thriving business, and his trade networks connected hinterland villages to Erzurum and Erzurum to the imperial capital. He was also an army contractor. He supplied the army with dried meat, and that business began during the Crimean War and continued by his sons after his murder. The notable was connected with high-ranking bureaucrats and army commanders through such transactions. This was the economic background of the transformation of a merchant entrepreneur from a humble artisan to a notable. And the symbol of this transformation was the imperial order of the second rank, namely the honorary rank of Saniye. This was a development in the age of reforms. The bureaucrats, army officers, and members of the class of the religious dignitaries all had separate pets and hierarchy of ranks. The ranks were courts that organized and gave a symbolic hierarchy to the expanding bureaucracy throughout the empire. By his recognition as a notable, Hachatur Efendi became a part of that hierarchy. When he died, the following was inscribed on his tombstone. The most eminent Hachatur Efendi, son of Ovanes the pilgrim, the pastrama maker, the high prince, the Ishan or not. There is something very interesting about the term used here, Visemashuk, which might be rendered in English as the most eminent or the most excellent, as most of the Armenian English dictionaries do. It is a rare one for the historians of the Ottoman Armenians, as they are accustomed to see Metabadir, the most honorable, in reference to Armenian men of high class, both lay and religious. Yet Visemashuk had a special meaning in the Ottoman context in the mid 19th century. It was a translation of Izzetlu, an honorary title given to the high state dignitaries who attained the second rank, Saniye, in the Ottoman administration. And his name was recorded uh, as Izzetli or Visemashuk after he got the order, uh, he got the rank. People took such symbolic transgression of ethnic boundaries very seriously. Among them, the Armenian patriarch in Istanbul, who congratulated Hachatur Efendi on attaining the rank. And in a document, in what seems to be a scribal mistake, we see Hachatur Efendi's family name, Pastırmacı, followed by the Persian suffix of Zade, meaning son of or descendant of, generally reserved for Muslims of high social background and rarely used for non-Muslims. Here, what we see is a symbolic aspect of a new social political order as the basis of the empire. Going back to Hachatur Efendi's biography, there is another aspect to, to his business portfolio which was closely related to his relations with, uh, with, with the relations between the notable social, economic, and symbolic power, namely the construction business. In the 1860s, we see the notable engaging in the rebuilding of the city. Here, he took advantage of the opportunities that emerged after the earthquake of 1859, which destroyed the city. 
But Chatur Efendi concentrated his activities, the construction activities or urban development, especially around the Gürcü Pasha Kapısı, the Georgian Gate neighborhood, to the north of the city. Yet, for this activity, he had to have close relations, not only with the state authorities, but also with the Islamic religious authorities in the town, as the properties around the region belong to various Afkaf, or Islamic religious endowments. In many cities in the Middle East today, Islamic endowments rent out commercial spaces to generate income for various charitable purposes and social services, such as providing education, aid to poor, and upkeep of mosques. One important aspect of these uh, properties is that they cannot be alienated, that they cannot be sold or bought in the estate market. I don't want to take your time with the details of the Islamic law, but one aspect is quite important for our discussion. With the practice, istibdal, exchange of such properties, such pious endowment properties, were made possible. This could take place when the property of the endowment could not fulfill its endowed purpose due to its ruined condition and could not be repaired. This was a hotly debated issue in the Islamic law, as the practice was open to corruption. The Hanafi school of theology, which the Ottoman state adhered, and there is no need to say, was the most flexible among the Islamic schools of law. And Hachatur Efendi is the one, uh, is one of the ones who used uh, it the most thanks to his connections. He exchanged large but ring shops in the city center for a new but small ones in the not so central neighborhoods. By doing so, he built his own commercial district around the Gürcü Kapısı. In the Russian map of Erzurum, which was captured from the Ottoman forces and during the World War I, the district, the one on the the right, uh, was named after the notable Pastırmacı neighborhood, Pastırmacı Mahallesi, where a series of small shops, two large commercial buildings, and the public bath, a um, hammam, were located. What did these uh, relations mean? Was it simply corruption, or to put mildly, taking advantage of the market? Or is there something else going on here, something that may give us hints about the power relations of that era? and the new imperial order at the local level. I will spend a minute on the issue of charity as a site to examine inter-ethnic relations in the period and try to answer some of these questions. Hachatur Efendi was known for his charity, a characteristic which was noted in almost every single text after his murder. For instance, he rebuilt his, this bell tower and the entrance hall in the courtyard of the main church, Cathedral of Erzurum, the, called Gavit, landmarks of the city in the pre-genocide period. And his charity was extended to Muslims as well. In the same neighborhood that Hachatur Efendi built his commercial buildings, he renovated the minaret of a mosque, which was destroyed during the earthquake. In the British Consul's words, he did it, the, he made the reconstruction, to the, to the horror of both Christians and Muslims. He also had food delivered to the prisoners in the city, to Christians on Sundays, and to Muslims on Fridays. Some of his charity demonstrates not only the extent of Hachatur Efendi's social and economic capital, but also the ways in which charity helped him to establish new social connections. In the most interesting case, he bailed out, uh, he bailed out of a prison a Kurdish chief who was elegantly sentenced to death. After being freed, the Pastor Maji family and the family of the Kurdish chief formed fictive kinship ties, anthropologically speaking, known as kirve. That means Hachatur Efendi sent his brother to a wedding at the household of the chief and paid for the expenses for the wedding ceremony. And the chief, in return, accepted the Armenian notable's family as a part of his clan, including offering them security. And this was not limited to the lifetime of the notable. During the Russia-Ottoman War of 1877-78, which was years after Hachatur Efendi's death, Ottoman officers tried to raid the Pastor Maji mansion and arrest the patriarch of the family, whom they accused of hoarding grain, an accusation which seems to have been true. Then, it was no other than the Kurdish chief who defended the house with his armed men until the Pastor Majians reached a compromise with the army. Such inter-ethnic relations constituted the power base of the notable as much as his economic power. Yet, it is important to show the ways in which this act of charity beyond one's ethnic group was related to other power dynamics in society. 
as Archidius Kahan, known for the Jewish merchants in Imperial Russia, a quick rise to power from humble artisanal background created envy among the local population. Or local population. In Hachatur Efendi's charity, what we see is an attempt to soothe these feelings by sharing his wealth with the poor and to increase his symbolic and social power through relations with other ethnic groups. The question of whether these crossing of the border between communities were taken as signs of changing social dynamics in the new imperial order and whether they thus resulted in resentment and generated an effect opposite to the one intended is an important one and needs to be researched in the future. Yet we have evidence that such backlash did exist and that it took the most violent form. Going back to the issue of exchanging properties and Islamic endowments, of Islamic endowments, Hachatur Efendi was able to purchase rights of certain underground water source, which was endowed to a Muslim Waq. In a eulogy written after the Notables murder, this was narrated in the following. He, he thought about the water of the public bath that he, built, he had built, from the city that is abundant with the water he picked, the good and cold one. He controlled the clean, abundant, and sewage one. The property became the proper, his property. The wa that water became his property. The water was endowed for a goal. He knew the Mutavelli would find that suitable. When he saw the water, they resisted. They organized conflict and went mad. First, Hachatur Efendi's properties were burned down as a warning. Bishop Tevkan, who was there at the moment, claims to have seen people who were quite happy about seeing the notables, or in the words of the mob, uh, the, the infidels, property being burned. Quote, the infidel has run wild. Gevur azmishidi, they murmured. The feelings of Muslims, Muslim crowd, are said to have been more or less clear. Although, it should be added that, according to the British Council, the governor and his men undertook, quote, heroic, long-continued efforts at the repeated risks of their lives to stop the con conflagration in, the, in that handsome quarter of the town, end of quote. As the Muslims' attitudes were not monolithic, neither were Armenians. The bishop adds a curious sentence in his text. I quote, there were some Christians, there were some among the Christians who were happy because of their ignorance, but many were deeply moved, end of quote. Was it simple, was it simple envy of the notable's quick rise to wealth that disturbed the, his uh, co-religionists? Or could it be also too much identification with the establishment that caused their discontent? Was there a common understanding of social limits in the local community shared by Muslims and Christians, an understanding that was challenged by notables, like Hachatur Efendi, and was Hachatur Efendi perceived to transgress them? Within a week after this incident, Hachatur Efendi was shot in the forehead by a Dagestani, a Caucasian immigrant, who was hired for the job by this, uh, some of the religious, the religious dignitaries from, from whom Hachatur Efendi had transferred property. The news reached Istanbul. Everybody was surprised. The government's response was to investigate, I quote, this very regrettable event, if it is true. The patriarch, together with some bishops, went to the government in person, submitted an official letter of complaint, as they usually do, a takrir. And one of the most connected and best integrated Armenian notables in the provinces was murdered. His murder has become part of another history. It was remembered by others only in other contexts, such as Ottoman misrule, Eastern question, oppression, oppression of Armenians, and even lack of capitalist development. Hachatur Efendi's biography had turned into the history of something else. And they were all uh, published around the time of the Armenian massacres, the Hamidian massacres in the mid 1890s. Okay. Oh, you can say this. The biographies of Kirkchubash Agov and Hachatur Efendi represent a moment in Ottoman history in which the formation of an imperial ethnicity, Ottoman, Osmanlı, foreseeing equality of members of different ethnic and religious groups seemed to be a plausible option. Now, Although an imperial ethnicity remained part of the discourses of the state and many intellectuals until the end of the empire, its heyday was the period of the 1850s, uh, 1850s to the late 1870s, the period of reform. After that time, 
as shown by Julia Cohen in her study on the Sephardic Jews in the late Ottoman Empire, the non-Muslim communities had to act simultaneously within different Ottomanist ideas and practices. She calls these different versions of uh, versions, civic and Islamic versions of Ottomanism, the former emphasizing equality and solidarity between the constituents of the empire, whereas the latter uh, does that while accepting a upper, a given the upper hand of the Muslims in society. Uh, what I have shown today is that these categories were in subtle tension from the very beginning. Muslims had the upper hand in the new order, yet it was open to negotiation. The language of Ottomanism, as I demonstrated in the case of Agop Efendi, was open to a limited group of people. The Armenian notables, who were able to speak this new imperial language, consolidated their power. When this language was put into practice and observed in everyday life, it was perceived as a challenge to the existing local and social order. And as the new imperial order was both a story of modern Ottoman state and the Armenian notables, as I argued, the, so were the reactions to it. I have to emphasize that neither this dream of creating an imperial ethnicity nor its elite character were unique to the Ottoman Empire, nor were such tensions. The Russian Empire undertook similar steps to integrate its non-Russian populations in the 19th century. As Robert Cruz argues, despite the dominant position of orthodoxy and existence of bureaucrats who defended its predominance in the empire, the, state, the, uh, Tarish, uh, the Russian state pursued projects of patronizing their re other religions including Islam and Muslim elites, to establish control over its diverse populations. Colonial empires also undertook similar projects. In the British Empire, for instance, as demonstrated by John Darwin recently, the empire had unified both in the, uh, the empire was unified both in the white dominions and the non-white colonies through the imperial ethnicity of Britishness. It was an imperial ideo ideology that not only disseminated from the metropole to the dominions and colonies, but required participation from below of many ethnic groups, including non-whites in the colonies, and particularly their elites. Yet, as we know from all these cases, these projects were multidimensional and resulted from the participation of many actors. My goal in the future will be an attempt to contribute to the lacun <coughs> in the scholarship on non-Muslims in the Ottoman Empire by examining the agency of Armenian notables and by thinking about the age of reforms through the notables networks and everyday practices. In doing so, I also aim to think of Ottomanism both as a new kind of practices among the leaders of constituent groups of the empire and as a language within which new power relations were formulated and expressed and possibilities and limits of transgressing commercial co communal boundaries. Where can we go from this? I will make only one suggestion out of many possible ones and conclude. Although I talk about only two Armenian notables from Erzurum, similar developments took place elsewhere. The Sharanian family in, in Wan, the Shahinian family in Sivas, the Nazaretians in Antep, are just few other of, few of the Armenian notables who rose to power in the mid-19th century. They were not merely bridges between the provinces and the center, but historical figures with different self-vision. Art historian Alison Wharton, who examined the main cathedral of Antep, constructed by Nicholas Nazaretian, a local notable in the last quarter of the 19th century, concludes. They were, the churches in the Arabic and Antep, a public proclamation of local and Ottoman solidarity on behalf of the notable of their Armenian <coughs> communities. The absence of ostensibly Armenian characters in both of these buildings reflect this desire to express social cohesion. The choice of this local style was not, however, just an effort to fit in uh, for fear of a collusion with the Muslim element. Instead, this style was a reflection of the genuine self-vision of these Armenians as participants in their local and imperial architecture of them. By zooming in on the ways in which these Armenian elites participated in the projects of imperial ethnicities at local level, we can think in fresh ways about the histories of the empire the issues of inclusion and exclusion in other imperial society. This will allow us to examine the Ottoman Empire and the history of Armenians and other ethnic groups in the empire, not as sui generis histories, but as participants in a shared history, yet their experiences resulting in their own self-visions. This will also help us 
not only to think about power relations between Muslims and non-Muslims in the Middle East in historical context, but also to reflect on the power relations in our current societies, emphasizing the connectedness of various actors and their achievements as a part of the society, and not overlooking the challenges that lie ahead. Thank you. Oh, yeah. yeah. You mentioned two, two wars with uh, Russia, uh, one in the early part of the century and one later. I'm, I'm interested in how the soldiers were, were they conscripted and were Armenians conscripted along with others and if they were conscripted and, and did Armenians rise to any uh, higher ranks in, this, in the military? Uh, if, thank you. No, 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 I mean, no, I'm quite very much interested in the uh, the services of Armenians and other non-Muslims in the Ottoman army, so for the, for the different reasons and for different periods. But uh, during the Crimean War, the answer is yes and no. Uh, these were not conscripted, but they worked for the army for the purposes of the government and the army through their notables. This is what I emphasize. But a friend of mine who had his degree from, uh, I can't remember where now, but uh, he wrote his dissertation now. He's at Yale uh, making his postdoc. Found out that even in the 1840s, this is a recent finding. I hope he will not get angry with me that I'm sharing it with you. But in the 1840s, he found out that, uh, that the Ottoman state also conscripted non-Muslims as a part of the modernizing uh, the army attempts. They were not uh, given arms. They were the, what they called as Amelia Taburu, the labor battalions. Mm -hmm. But this is what we think is a very later development, discussed in the 1877-78, didn't take place, and it took place only after the uh, Constitutional Revolution in 1908. But apparently, there were Armenian and non-Muslim soldiers in the army even before that. So uh, my answer to that is, as far as I know, that mm -hmm. is. And also, there were also the Armenian doctors who served in the army, who were educated in the uh, military academies and other academies in Istanbul. Thank you for uh, looking at that period when things are uh, actually uh, in, in, in peace. Uh, one thing uh, to comment is that this is the period uh, where you have Mithat Pasha's memoirs, mm -hmm. uh, because this is when he was very powerful. And there, there is a reference, actually, to non-Muslims being a part of the military, uh, mm -hmm. but rather than being uh, mobilized and conscripted, they are uh, volunteers. Mm -hmm. And he talks about a volunteer uh, uh, sort of regiment actually marching through in Istanbul, mm -hmm. uh, where they would have both, uh, you know, the crescent and the, the cross together as their flags. A and uh, he also talks about similar ones in the Balkans when he is serving there as mm -hmm. the governor. So I have a feeling this was much more a, a, a Western phenomenon rather than an Eastern one in the sense that these were mostly people recruit, I mean, who were like volunteering either from Istanbul or from the Balkans. So that may be an interesting uh, twist uh, to think about. I uh, if I can respond to that, yeah, I, thank you for that. I, I didn't look, since this, that, that wasn't my uh, focus, I didn't look at the Mithat Pasha's memoir, but it's an interesting one. Uh, I have the chance to go through the parliamentary debates of the first parliament, the uh, 1877-78 parliament, and the parliamentarians, uh, Daniel Harachian from Erzurum, openly says that they had a regiment of, a regiment is kind of big, from Erzurum as well, who participated, and it was 1877. So I wouldn't necessarily say it's Western, but it was taken in other parts, and I think the Armenian notables were organizing it to show that how loyal they were. So this is why I'm constantly emphasizing their class aspect and the, their role as the notables over the society. It wasn't that bad, come on. But. <laughs> lot to think about. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to think a little bit more about the language which mm -hmm. Hakop uh, Kurkup Boshi was Hakop. using, right? So um, did we not? Did we not give? Did, mm -hmm. did we not donate? And, and so he, 
You were thinking about it more in terms of, you said, negotiations, mm -hmm. right? And um, bargaining, right? Um, and I, I'm, I'm wondering, first of all, what if, what if that we is not really about we fully the Armenian community, right? Mm -hmm. Because even though it's true that he builds Armenian schools and all, mm -hmm. if your argument, which you, you really pushed to at the end uh, with a quote from mm -hmm. Allison, right, mm -hmm. is more about sort of an, an interconnection, right, a, a new kind of community mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. being mm -hmm. built, right, then this we, did we not, right, is first of all picking up, did we not donate, picking up on maybe a practice already of charity and benefit, right? But here in this context, it seems like it's a different kind of a sense of duty and expectation from um, from the government officials, right? So that that, that maybe it's about uh, appropriating a language of um, an economy of, of sharing that then perhaps gets politicized around a new economy of governments and, and duties and responsibilities. Mm -hmm. No, no, I, I completely agree, and this is that's what I said. At the, I am planning to go through the, all of my fundings through that perspective of can we think of these notables as a kind of a unique or a kind of a different uh, emergent constituents of the empire. And I think that's a very good way of uh, thinking about that, what that we mean. Uh, yes, this, it might mean not only that the, that the tool of bargaining, but it might be also somewhat related to their own perception or vision. So I will keep that in mind. Yeah. But I have to go through the, his other writings because he has a very di interesting... Uh, thanks to the, this uh, arrest, that he got arrested, we, he left lots of personal documents, which is kind of, kind of very rare for the period. So I will go through those uh, writings once again with a different eye. This is the kind of the next step of my project. Definitely, I will look at it. Thank you. Thank you, Tolga, so much. That was a great talk. Um, uh, a comment, and then I'm going to ask about oppression um, <laughs> that you so nicely um, asked us to ask you about. Um, so one thing, I, I really enjoyed, enjoyed the idea of you challenging the state as the sort of homogenous entity that functions sort of top-down and, and using these notables as not only intermediators, but also people who are constructing identities uh, by themselves. Another literature that has uh, has helped me think through this, this project, uh, sort of think through the position of notables in Beirut has been uh, Joel Mitgell's State in Society. That's the approach that I use in yeah. my dissertation. I didn't want to use it Exa too much. Yeah, exactly. exactly. And so I think that that is another way of, exactly. um, of Thank you. So I'm in the good yeah, track. Good. Framing that. <laughs> Um, and, and then I wanted to ask you, so, so you talked, of course, about these notables um, providing for the state uh, in these instances mm -hmm. of the military and so on. Um, but yes, tell us about their positioning or their mm -hmm. themselves positioning within society do, uh, through oppression. And mm -hmm. I want to hear more about that, I think. Okay. Thank you. And also, uh, thank you for, I, I never know how to pronounce migdals name so it's well, no, I don't <laughs> so it's a good one from now on that I can use it uh, so with the oppression uh, there were different ways and levels but they all relate okay so there were a few cases especially they were all related to the not all but mostly related to uh, Bash Agop and he since he had a, such a predominant position within the community and he was in such a good terms with the government and the state officials and whoever came, he kept his position uh, as a governor and an army commander in the region. For instance, he not only arranged these networks of granaries, sent them to the uh, front, but all, he also made direct purchases from the population, and mainly from the Armenians of Daron and Mush. And uh, what the quote was referring to, quote was from 1870, the Bishop Devkans went to uh, Erzurum and was broken in 1872, and it's from that era, from 71, 72. And that was the period that the people of Mush were still trying to get their money. 
back from the notable and he didn't pay them back and we are talking about 500,000 crush which has a kind of a big money and for the era and what else he did huh. and thanks to his position as well he obtained tax farms which supposedly should not exist and he was also the tax farmer of tobacco in Bush and Bitlis region and uh, the, the population the Armenians were constantly criticizing the or sending petitions and uh, this they were only able to do openly though that uh, confront the notable in 1869 or 70 during one meeting of the provincial meeting when the governor was present apparently they selected their bishop as and they sent they sent their bishop with two notes the one of the notes said was about the Kurdish oppression and the second note was about Kürtçübaşı by the way they never paid there I removed that part from the talk not to get into but there is also a document like they list this is the amount they took in that year for this reason and they didn't pay and these are the things that he did uh, so they, they were this is one aspect that his control over ruler but also since he was so uh, powerful in the city in the 1860s when there was also the Armenian community was transformed or was through getting uh, was in the process of transformation to a modern community through this Armenian what's called as Armenian Armenian constitution of 1863 there was few communal uh, bodies communal administrative bodies were established and they were also controlled by the Kürtçübaşı so especially like the when the uh, artisans who were as we know from the broader history of the Ottoman Empire that they were losing their economic power in the second half of the 19th century were also losing their social and political power if we can talk about the political power within their communities because the new modern reformed uh, administrative bodies didn't work for them they work for the wealthy and the powerful people and even there in the mid 60s I from the Armenian newspapers so the Armenian newspapers were also divided this is my main source for the era are divided into two like the pro uh, elite stance I would rather say and pro quote unquote reform stance and the pro reform stance was supporting Crimean Hayrik and at some certain point even that the, I it's I talk about it in my dissertation that the, one of the petitions I think put it that way that the, the most important enemy of Rumian hiring is Kürtçübaşı Agop because he was seen as all the kind of reforms all, all the changes that were envisioned by the population was blocked obstacled by this notable and the people like him but nobody was able to uh, relocate him and that's the most interesting part uh, I know I talk too much but this is a very fascinating thing uh, at the end of 1860s there were one of the drogomans this is a very nice story that the drogoman of the French consulate tried to kill his wife to get in to marry with Kürtçübaşı's daughter and uh, he was a Catholic somehow he turned into an apostolic Armenian he was a Catholic Armenian the drogoman the Kürtçübaşı was an apostolic definitely. and Kürtçübaşı's daughter was a widow but uh, the real issue here is that the Kürtçübaşı as notable of the town did not allow that marriage and the bishop he was his uh, closest ally uh, also didn't allow and if the bishop doesn't allow then you cannot get married so what happened was the town was divided into two uh, the, at the during the ceremony police raided ceremony arrested five priests out of 11 which means half of the priests were anti uh, <laughs> and they were exiled to a monastery uh, and while this taking place yes and then both artisans sent petitions to Istanbul and uh, elites sent their petitions to the patriarchate Patri the elite said like uh, what's going on I mean these artisans are rebelling against us and uh, it was like the, the artisans petition so the patriarchate is like the Magna Carta it's not like a, if you don't we don't like a, if you do not protect us against these notables and they openly say that like a, we will do go with their own way 
what is most interesting thing about that episode was all the notables, including uh, Pastor Majian, who is usually considered as a very nice person, uh, allied with the Kukchibashi. There was only one notable who was with the artisans. And that, art, that notable never returned to Arzurum after the world, uh, after the Ottoman War of 1877 78. So apparently, and he wasn't from Arzurum, I interpret it as building a power base through the, these, like, uh, kind of playing with the emotions of these artisans and trying to make a power base. But it shows that the entire society was divided among these economic and social lines. And the languages that I talked today about this Ottomanism and in other in other chapters of my dissertation, and I would like to proceed more, I talk about the language of constitutionalism within the Armenian community. They brought changes to the, co but also they, they were expressions of certain trends that were, or the issues that were going within the communities. So this is kind of my take, but yes, there were lots of oppression. I will conclude with that. <laughs> Thank you then.